This is the Webster Insider. Welcome to the Webster Insider. I'm Kelly Bowen. And I'm Lonnie Walton. We're coming to you from the School of Communications in Sertham Hall, where there's undeniably a lot of buzz in every sense of the word. A major renovation, many years in the making, has begun its second phase. That's right, Lonnie. The second phase of what's being called the Swear Drop Reimagine campaign officially began in early February. This time around, the building's entire west wing is closed off and is now an active construction site. Phase one of the Swear Drop Reimagine campaign was completed in 2018 and introduced new studios, interactive classrooms, and spaces designed to encourage student-faculty collaboration. For Phase 2, the West Wing of Sphereddrop will be rebuilt as a state-of-the-art media production and communication facility. They're just going to be amazing spaces that, you know, the students are, are going to have a lot better access to current technology, and it, it, we're all really looking forward to that as it comes, you know, as it comes into play. Some of these new updates will include an audio and video production and recording suite, soundstage, workshop space, photography studio, animation, game design, and video post-production labs, along with flexible teaching spaces. And Lonnie, we're told construction and renovation work should be completed before the start of the upcoming fall semester. Kelly, in other news, while there are hopeful signs the pandemic is easing, it continues to reverberate on campus and on the student body. Webster Insider's Caleb Sprouse joins us with a story. Thank you, Lonnie. In St. Louis and across the country, restrictions are being relaxed on a daily basis regarding masks and social distancing. But here on campus, it doesn't mean everything is back to what we're used to seeing before the pandemic. Two years into the COVID-19 pandemic, Webster University students are still struggling to return to normal. Because of the isolation periods that we had to go through, the sense of community kind of dismantled a little bit. In an email, Jennifer Stewart of the Office of Student Engagement pointed out the pandemic has affected student participation in organizations, mainly because students themselves are choosing how they'd like to be involved. Blaine McVeigh, the SGA comptroller, believes the lack of involvement can influence the experiences of foreign exchange students in campus morale. And I think a lot of international students and study abroad students are expecting to be immersed in the culture and the student activity here. And it's just another barrier for them when they arrive. It's hard for international students to begin with. Um, but if we provide a robust campus that has a lot of things to, to do and uh, for them to make connections, I think it makes their uh, their process joining here a lot easier. So a lot of students who come from different campuses, even though their campuses are smaller, it's a more tight-knit community. So people are used to walking around a campus, talking to friends, hanging out in the common spaces. And I think that's uh, not as common here. And clubs can really help create those common spaces. But at the same time, a lot of stuff is happening virtually. A worrisome downside to the lack of student engagement is that organizations representing marginalized groups such as Leatris McNeil's Society of Women of Color, have struggled to maintain involvement. But our events kind of dwindled a little bit. Like in 2019, when we had our first event, I think we had about like 15 or 20 people come. And then after the pandemic, I did a another event that was on Zoom. And I think Zoom is what made it kind of, you know, eh, because I feel like, as, like, especially as a student, I was Zoomed out. The university has modified some of its pandemic restrictions, but will campus involvement return to pre-pandemic levels? We will have to see. I'm Caleb Sprouse. Soon, every restroom across the university's home campus in Webster Groves all 139 of them will be stocked with free period products. This is all made possible due to a groundbreaking initiative by Webster's Student Government Association, along with support from students and faculty. Reporter Claudio Cobos has details. Claudio? Thank you, Kelly. Kelly, the CEA Period Equity Project is a response to what is known as a period poverty, the lack of access to menstrual products by as much as 84% of students in America. The SGA will soon stock all the bathrooms on campus with menstrual pads and tampons for all students. 
the SGA is partnering with Antflow, a women-owned company, to provide biodegradable products to all students in every bathroom on campus. So this idea originated last year in our Diversity and Inclusion Committee. We were thinking about how we could support um, those who identify as females on campus, and so we were interested in getting period products on campus. Yeah, like my own friends were excited that it was on campus because I honestly was like, you know, it should have been on campus a long time ago, in my opinion, so I'm glad that we're doing it now because um, e even myself and just people that I know have expressed a lot of gratitude for it, and they're looking forward to it. The Peer Equity Project also gained support from Webster staff like Jody Spies, an assistant professor, and Webster alumna, an advocate for the project. Jody helps the program by creating the materials that helps generate funds and awareness for the project. I realized how important it was, and I was really impressed that the students um, cared about such a thing. You know, we have everything we need when we go to the bathroom, um, and so should those who, um, who menstruate. So to me it made sense that um, students should have access to what they need on campus. We wanted these products to be free and we wanted them to be accessible. So the dispensaries will not only have Braille and Spanish on them, but they will also be installed at a height that is um, compliant with the Americans with the Disability Act. The CGA is hoping for all installations for all dispensaries will be done by the end of the semester. They're also working closely with Director of Facilities Rick Gerger for a transition of dispensaries who work by coin to a more practical way to pay metro products. For West Insider, I'm Claudio Cobos. The American Red Cross earlier this year issued its first ever blood crisis. The Red Cross, which provides 40% of the nation's blood supply, is in urgent need of blood donors. As reporter Jordan Parker tells us, several factors are contributing to the shortage. While the Red Cross contributes 40% of the nation's blood supply, more significantly, it also provides over 50% of the St. Louis area's blood supply. We need to collect about 13,000 donations nationwide every day. So if we're getting fewer than that, let's say it's only 10,000 based on those figures I gave you, it means that the, the blood that we would distribute to hospitals, we're not giving them the full assortment of what their blood product should be. When that happens and you delay procedures, that could be the difference between life and death. The problem? Winter weather and ongoing concern of the COVID-19 pandemic. When we have that summer shortage, we get into September, we get back into schools. By late September, early October, we've, we've overcome those challenges of the summer. We never got over that hump last year. But this is probably the more critical time because we're dealing with cold and flu season. We're dealing with winter weather and we still have COVID these last two years. That's another wrinkle that's really made things a little bit more difficult. Susan McFarland, associate professor here at the university, also points out political and social factors stopping people who would otherwise donate blood from doing so. You know, I, I do think that there is more that the country could be doing from a, a policy standpoint. There are a lot of people who still can't donate blood because of the AIDS crisis in the 1980s. Among the Red Cross guidelines targeted towards LGBTQIA individuals, men who have sex with men must defer for three months from the most recent sexual contact. And we need to... Uh, to, you know, to talk to our lawmakers and and show them the evidence that this is just um, it's a a bigoted way of looking at blood donation that is not scientifically valid. If COVID concerns are keeping you from donating blood, don't worry. Donation centers are keeping up with COVID guidelines and safety protocols. If you go wear a mask and are social distancing, your risk is very low, especially if you're vaccinated and boosted. Even when we get out of this crisis, the need to keep up donating blood is still an important factor in keeping us from another crisis scenario. I always tell people, don't wait for something personal to happen. You know, do it because it's the right thing to do. You'll feel good about it. And you know, you'd want someone to do it for you. Since the Red Cross declared the blood crisis, it appears the problem has only gotten worse. Further perpetuated when the St. Louis region was hit last month with a string of hazardous winter weather. The storms forced donor centers to close, resulting in dozens of blood drives canceled across the region. Here's why you should consider donating blood. Your donation will be used to treat accident victims, cancer patients, and even new mothers experiencing complicated childbirths. The Red Cross encourages you to schedule an appointment by using the American Red Cross blood donor app, by visiting redcross.org, or by calling 1-800-RED-CROSS. Lonnie, back to you. Thank you, Jordan. As we all emerge from two years of the COVID-19 pandemic, many of us find ourselves navigating what it's like to live in a post-pandemic society. And that concludes many of the things we used to take for granted, dining out, 
going to the movies and visiting other public gathering spots like museums. The Missouri History Museum in Forest Park has had to weather the pandemic storm in more ways than one. Webster Insider's Alex Darmody explains. In late August, the Missouri History Museum opened its current in-person exhibit, St. Louis Sound. The exhibit covers musicians from the area who became legends in the industry. Big names like Nelly, Ike and Tina Turner, and Chuck Berry. We wanted to come up with one exhibit that would try to give you the big overarching look at all of the music the city has produced. Uh, from ragtime and those really early artists like Scott Joplin, all the way up to Nelly and some of the more recent artists that have had huge success coming out of St. Louis. But there are all these other genres of music that St. Louis rarely gets talked about. So uh, more recent genres, things like punk rock and hip hop. A lot of people, I think, would presume there was no early punk rock scene in St. Louis, and that is totally untrue. We actually had fascinating things happening here, even though it never really got talked about on a national basis or record companies weren't coming here looking for uh, punk rock groups to make records the way they were in places like New York or London or Los Angeles. But due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Missouri History Museum only fully reopened to the public just recently after closing for a few months. Music is one of those fascinating topics because no matter who you are, you love music. Every Everyone experiences music. Everyone has music that they personally enjoy. And so this was a really exciting exhibit because unlike some other topics where it might be hard to convince people that they, they are interested in something like baseball or military history or, you know, whatever it might be, music is sort of a natural uh, um, open door for people. So we really wanted it to cover that, that wide range and try to catch everybody at their natural interest and pull them in. It's something we try really hard to do with exhibits is sort of meeting people where they are. It's our job to grab people by the hand and sort of say, like, come see this fascinating history. I bet you never knew we had all this exciting things to tell you. Um, so that was something that this one, we, we really tried hard to get that wide range and really cover a lot of a lot of different genres and styles. For the Webster Insider, I'm Alex Darmody. The Missouri History Museum is open Tuesday through Sunday from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. and later on Thursday nights until 8 p.m. Admission to the museum is free. Well, who doesn't love puppies or kittens for that matter? The thought of animals is sure to bring a smile to those of us who are pet owners or who grew up with a family pet. In addition to the companionship they provide, pets become a consistent source of comfort and support during the hardships caused by the pandemic and they continue to play the role in our everyday lives. Webster Insider's Courtney Schmidicki has the story. Nothing compares the joy of coming home to a loyal companion. The unconditional love of a pet can do more than keep you company. Pets may also decrease stress, improve heart health, and even help with your mood. I know that if I have a, a rough day or a rough class that day, that I drive, you know, my 20 minute drive home, uh, and she's going to be there. She she doesn't care how bad of a day I had, how good of a day I had. She's going to be there. You know, she she can read people better than other people can read people. So if someone's upset and crying, she'll come lick your tears off your face. If you're mad, she'll come sit on your lap and calm you down kind of thing. So she she reads people very well. People who experience stress, anxiety, depression, and other psychological ailments have been proven to show an increase in dopamine levels and a decrease in heart rate when interacting with a pet. Examples of how pets can help someone emotionally include comfort for PTSD, someone who has lost a loved one, someone with stress, or someone who is mentally or physically disabled. I like to say that we saved her, or she saved me just as much as I saved her. Whether you are petting a dog or watching a fish swim around in its tank, the emotional benefits of having an animal companion are enormous. Not only do pets bring about better overall mental health at home, the American Heart Association says pets might also translate to better performance while at work. The American Heart Association points to studies that show having pets in the workplace helps reduce stress and improve employee satisfaction and even increase worker productivity. It's definitely a good argument for having more bring your pet to work days at the office. Kelly, back to you. Thank you, Courtney. And finally, have you ever wondered what it takes to feed an entire student body? Kelly, I was wondering that myself, so I went straight to the source. 
from Cyber Cafe to Marletto, Webster's Dining is hoping to make these dining spaces a place where you can hang out with your buddies, relax, or just have a tasty meal. I like it because it has vegan options because I'm a vegan. Um, so whenever I'm at the UC, there's not as uh, not as prevalent options for that. But here, I mean, you can get a sandwich, you can get the, the vegetarian option, you can get all the sides. It depends, it changes every day. Oh, like they really? had um, fish tacos one day, today they had like this weird ramen bowl, which was really good. Um, and in the mornings they have omelets, which are the best. We do have several uh, items that are very popular. But one that still surprised me every year is chicken tenders. We gotta make sure we run out of chicken tender because that that's, can create some riots in here. So. Marletto's offers a variety of tasty snacks, hot and cold. Although Marletto's is making waves, there is still always room for improvements. Um, admittedly, I wish there was maybe a bit more variety, like a lot of it's fried food and it's the same variant of the food each time, but still, for like a school cafeteria, it's pretty good. Definitely a lot better than what I had in high school. And yes, COVID did wear its ugly head in the mix. The population is lower, uh, and it has created a vacuum on the workforce. Uh, it's hard to get help. Thankfully, my employees here are very good employees, and they, 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 they come forward, and they step forward, to make sure that we take care of the students. But they're working long hours, but uh, there's a little bit of hope because I interviewed some people this week, so I'm, I think we're gonna have a few extra people coming <laughs> to the rescue. Slowly but surely, the, the university's dining services are getting back to full operations. With as many as seven locations open for a meal or a quick coffee or snack during a normal school day. And the offerings are varied from Cyber's Cafe to the Crossroads Food Court, it's best to check the Webster Dining page online for the latest information. And that completes this edition of the Webster Insider. I'm Lonnie Walton. And I'm Kelly Bowen. We all wish you a happy spring. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.